uh, for both the invitation as well as uh, for a wonderful talk. I think that sets the tone for all the talks. So you have very illustrative videos. So I'll uh, start uh, talking about My Child Can't See is written the culprit. So I just slightly modified the title to make it like uh, share my experience where I have felt that retina is the culprit and how I established the diagnosis. I will be going through a case based approach so that it will be easy for all of us to understand and I will try to highlight common features that point to the retinal pathology and <laughs> at the same time describe in brief the retinal conditions and highlight the investigations that are, give the pointer to the particular etiology. Uh, just a small disclaimer that I am not a very thorough expert in the field but I am sharing whatever I have learned in this field so if someone, someone knows better they can definitely chip in. So I will uh, begin with the first case. This is a two years old child brought to us with complaints of poor vision from early infancy. So the history was similar as highlighted before, does not recognize parents, there is no eye contact, does not reach out for the toys and bright lights. Importantly there was history of seizures from early infancy and uh, as regards the relevant history there is no history suggestive of perinatal asphyxia and there was no significant family history so uh, of similar disease but at the same time we inquired about the history of parental consanguinity and the parents were related as the first degree cousins and this child was born to a consanguineous marriage this is a representative video of a similar patient i couldn't record in the same patient so we see that there is poor dazzle reflex in both eyes the child is actually not interested in the targets and rather we can see that there are searching eye movements and uh, it's more like a wandering fixation the entire segment was within normal in both eyes and the fundus examination in this patient was unremarkable at this age so it is possible even if there is a retinal pathology the child might appear to have a very normal looking fundus in very young age that's why this is important to keep in mind given this i had two major differential diagnoses cerebral visual impairment and labor's congenital amyogasis as we noted before there was no significant history of perinatal asphyxia so cerebral visual impairment was lower in the diagnosis but i started noticing the child more carefully and there was a ocular digital sign which was noted and there was mild enophthalmos the neuroimaging was still obtained because the fundus was quite normal and we can see that it's exact it's uh, looking like a completely normal neuroimaging for the age and there was no evidence of asphyxia or hypoxic changes in the periventricular or the occipital lobes the patient was sent for testing for lca mutations and the patient turned out to be positive so that established the diagnosis this is a representative patient who is around six years old. I took from my colleague, Dr. Tapas, from uh, Bhuneshwar campus. And you can see here actually that there are significant uh, RP changes seen in the posterior pole and they were actually extending all the way till the mid periphery. And the OCT does not show much changes but shows a little bit widening of the foveal contour. This is another representative case showing the ocular digital sign uh, which I could record at in an older patient. So you can see that the child is using the index finger, sometimes the thumb to poke and you can see a characteristic enough thalmos in this patient. Actually the patient also had a coexisting keratoconus possibly secondary to the eye rubbing. Uh, so how can you use the electrophysiology to diagnose this case? We can use at this age the handheld electroretinogram machines. We have the, the LKC company that is uh, manufacturing and distributing it in India. I have no financial interest but uh, it's a very good tool we are using in uh, our patients and as was highlighted that it's difficult to obtain electroretinogram in a very young child but with this it's quite easy and it takes a couple of minutes to obtain a good electroretinogram. These are the normal representations. You can see a small A wave and a B wave and it can be seen in both scotopic as well as the photopic responses. You can record both kind of things and you can record the 30 hertz flicker response also. So this is a normal looking response. Important to remember that the machine itself, how does it give the printout? It is. It will be important for us to interpret in this talk, that's why I'm trying to share this slide. And this is the photopic response. For the photopic responses, there is an inbuilt normative database for children of different ages. So if you see the green bar which is there, that tells that the response, how it is coming. If it is within the green bar, it tells that it is within the expected normal for the children. Yellow zone indicates its borderline. It's same, something like in 2.5% of normal patients. And red bar definitely indicates it's abnormal. 
So if you see for the given response, you can see that for the B wave amplitudes and the implicit times, it will give the values. And if they are in green, they are normal for this child. If they are in red, it's abnormal. So this is how you can interpret this. Now for the representative case from uh, Dr. Tapas, we saw there was no reproducible B waves in the, either in the scotopic or in the photopic responses, which clinched our diagnosis. So this is how it will look in a LCA case. So uh, very briefly about LCA, it's a rare inherited retinal disorder with onset in very early childhood. Usually there's poor vision and it's actually severe vision impairment like in our case. And usually they have nystagmus and it's more like a wandering eye movements with rapid movement nystagmus. Patients can have photoaversion or photophobia and they do have the frangicitis ocular digital sign, uh, might even have keratoconus. The most important differential diagnosis are early onset severe retinal dystrophy, also called as EOSRD, and severe chi early childhood onset retinal dystrophy, which is also called CCORD. These are very similar. They have small differences in the, they, they are genetically different because they occur on different gene loci, but at the same time with their representation, they are slightly different, but it's important to distinguish because the visual potential is slightly better with these two as compared to a patient with LCA. With this, uh, we'll move to the second case. This is a case of a three-year-old child who was referred for evaluation for poor vision in both eyes and inability to open eyes in broad daylight. Of not, the child was unable to open eyes even in the room light. And there was a better visual behavior in the evening and dim illumination. The visual acuity as recorded by teller acuity was subnormal, 20 by 710, which is definitely less for the age. And refraction was not significant for age. This is the representative photograph of the same patient showing that the child has diff great difficulty in opening eyes in broad daylight, but by using the special glasses with red filters, you can see that the child is open, able to open light, uh, eyes in the uh, daylight. So this is the uh, handheld ERG which was done for this patient. Actually, patient was little uncooperative and it did actually under the sedation. And uh, you can see that the scotopic responses over here, they are pretty good. You can see the responses are there. For the scotopic responses, there is no normative database. So you have to see that B waves are forming and they are looking like what you expect for this age. So company doesn't have this database, but by our experience, it looks slightly subnormal, but not bad. But see the photopic responses. You cannot see any B waves there. And you can see everything is in red, suggesting that it's a severe con dysfunction. And the patient is primarily having a road dependent vision. So. This is another representative photograph of a patient which is little older. We could obtain good photographs and we can see that there is a macular hyperpigmentation in both eyes over there. And if you obtain the autofluorescence, you can obtain that there is a central hypoautofluorescence followed by a small area of hyperautofluorescence, which is typical in patients with cone dystrophy. So this is how you will diagnose a patient with cone dystrophy. Sorry, it's case three. Uh, I had moved the order, so I couldn't change. I'm sorry for that. It's a seven-year-old child which has come to us now for squint surgery for esotropia and patient had undergone uh, MR recession in both eyes. But the presenting complaint now is that child has poor vision and difficulty in reading from distance despite having undergone the squint surgery which was done quite a uh, few years ago. So the child's uh, more important history is that difficulty is vision is there both during daytime as well as night. So as compared to the previous patient which was having hemalaropia or more difficulty during the daytime vision, this patient has uh, difficulty in both but is slightly better in the daytime. So this is a fundus examination of the patient. You can appreciate a subtle disc pallor. We can see attenuation of the blood vessels. I think it's not projecting so well over there but on my laptop the projection is better. I don't know. We can reduce the illumination in the front. And uh, you can see actually there are pigmentary changes in the foveal area and uh, the autofluorescence images, they show sim uh, sim similar area of hypoautofluorescence in the cone area, in the fovea. And there is pigmentary loss in the mid periphery also. There are stippled hyperautofluorescence in between. So this patient has more diffuse dysfunction and autofluorescence plays a great role in picking up these things. It can be done in majority of patients. The OCT of the macula shows for widening of foveal contour and loss of the uh, photoreceptors in the outer retinal zones with foveal thinning, suggesting that this patient has both cone and road dysfunction. 
and the ERG in this patient, this is a metrovision ERG which uh, we can obtain in uh, older patients more easily. We can see that uh, in this there are different plots. There's a pattern ERG, scotopic responsive, which represent the cone responses, sorry, the rod responses, and the photopic responses, which are telling the cone responses. Normally we have everywhere A wave, B wave, and a falling C wave, but you can see that no responses are there. And for the photopic flicker, you will have multiple responses. But here you have a pan uh, retinal dysfunction, rod and cone both are subnormal. This is how a normal ERG will look like. The scotopic responses, you can appreciate the A wave, B wave, and then the, this is a scotopic oscillatory potentials. These are the cone responses, the photopic 3 hertz ERG and the photopic 30 hertz flicker. This, this slide just tells which are the cells which are responsible for each function. So distinguishing between the second and the third case, the uh, the second, third case had the pan day dysfunction, whereas the first patient had dysfunction mainly in the day light. So that gives you some clue, and then you can look for the changes both in the posterior pole as well as towards the mid periphery also. Uh, then, amongst the road con dystrophy versus con dystrophy, you can uh, distinguish by looking at where the patient's visual function is more affected. Whether it's more in the day, it's more likely to be con rod. If it's more like uh, night time, it's likely to be rod con dystrophy. And autofluorescence ERG play a major role. Okay. We move to another case. Uh, this is a 16 years old boy brought to us for poor vision for distance and year. The vision is worse in night and the age at onset was only six years. The personal and family history is not contributory, but the BCVA is very less, 2600. Interior segment is normal. This is the fundus picture. It's easy to diagnose. You have a lot of pigmentary, spicule-like pigmentary changes even at the posterior pole. And there is a uh, slight pallor of disc, diffusely attenuated blood vessels. So this patient has a early onset retinitis pigmentosa, not, easy, not difficult to diagnose. But see the autofluorescence. It tells you the magnitude of the damage. So you can see diffuse uh, autofluorescence changes all over the fundus. And the ERG classically shows an extinguished pattern. Both the rod and the con responses are affected, but there are some reproducible con responses over there. What was remarkable that in both eyes, this patient had a macular hole over there. You can see that there is a complete loss of the retinal layers at the macula, which was possibly responsible for the poor vision of this child. What is important to remember is that early onset retinitis pigmentosa usually has autosomal recessive or X-linked recessive pattern of inheritance. Often parental consanguinity might be there. Your ERG is confirmatory. Most of the patients will first present with poor night vision followed by poor vision for all time and for all ranges of vision. What is important to remember if you have a central vision loss or a very poor visual acuity as recorded in this patient, you look for one of these things, foveal thinning, cellophane maculopathy, and central retinitis pigmentosa, which will account for this. Okay. Another interesting case, uh, this is a 10-year-old boy who presented with history of using glasses. Patient is having significant hypermetropia, similar in both eyes, and is diagnosed as ametropic amblyopia. Visual acuity is 20, 100, 21, 25, right and left eye, and patient has been actually doing alternate patching for over an year. When we saw, there was no improvement. And the uh, anterior segment was unremarkable. The fundus is noted to be normal by the previous examiners, but if you see carefully, you can see that the fovea is not normal. You can see a subtle elevation, and possibly in this, you can see that there are small speck-like things over here. You can also appreciate that there are speck-like changes all over the posterior pole. So I went ahead and looked for the more peripheral changes and then you can see that there is a small retinal elevation over there which is and the retinal blood vessels are going over there. This is a, actually a shiitic cavity within in the periphery of the retina and the OCT showed that this patient actually had a foveal elevation and juvenile retinal sciasis. Okay, so th this completes the diagnosis. The handled ERG showed that there are, for the scotopic responses, B wave was less than the A wave and the photopic responses were also subnormal, suggesting panretinal dysfunction and uh, letting us conclude. So th this is an excellent juvenile retinal crisis. It is rare and uh, uh, I think uh, what is important to know is that these patients can be helped by giving acetazolamide, dorzolamide and gene therapy trials are on the way. Uh, another important case, five years old girl referred for unexplained vision loss and the patient has nystagmus. There is no significant family history except for history of consanguinity. Visual acuity is 20-100 and this is how the fundus looks like. 
important to note there is no foveal depression there so it's it's a case of a isolated foveal hypoplasia without other oculocutaneous albinism we see a remarkable number of them as in our part of the world because of the consanguinity and the oct changes oct changes can help you distinguish it's a uncommon condition and uh, can have both autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive forms and uh, though it is more commonly associated with oca aniridia rop but there are multiple mutations which are associated with only isolated foveal hypoplasia there is grading available i will not go through it and i have only one more case to show this is a case of a patient referred for unexplained vision loss the patient was diagnosed elsewhere as malingering the patient's visual acuity was 2000 and we can see that the fovea looks normal there is auto uh, uh, ffa oct changes which uh, oct which looked quite normal but the clinching point here is the multifocal ERG. Look at the central waveforms over there, they are all attenuated. So this is a patient which has actually occult macular dystrophy. By doing the routine examination, we cannot pick it up. By doing the OCT also, we may see some changes, but in the early, change, early stages it might be normal. Only multifocal ERG helps. So we do not dismiss them as malingering, but go on to obtain a multifocal ERG is the message. This is another patient showing the subnormal central peaks in the multifocal ERG. And last, we do see patients who have a history of ROP, uh, prematurity, and look for the laser marks. The, the poor vision could be due to the dragging of the fovea and dragging of the disc, and there could be lamellar macular holes. And uh, look for the relevant history. In FEBI, look for family history, and in ROP, look for history of prematurity. So just to summarize, retinal pathologists keep your suspicion high in a child referred for unexplained vision loss. Suspect when you have a normal interior segment, look for nystagmus. Family history, especially for consanguinity, history of photophobia, photoaversion, and nyctalopia. And keep in mind no history of perinatal asphyxia, which will be important in the coming talk. Look for isolated foveal hypoplasia, drist drag. Look also for the retinal changes on the posterior pole and periphery. Sometimes the peripheral things will help you clinch the diagnosis. OCT and autofluorescence play a major role, and ERG, even handled ERG, can help you clinch the diagnosis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Virinder. It was very illustrative. Now, may I invite